<clears throat> I think one thing that intrigues me is the business of disintegration, because it seems to be a recurrent theme with almost, um, certainly with the work of various people with whom I'm emotionally attached, and I suppose it's, it, it's to do with things that I do myself as well. <clears throat> and I think that what is, is very clever about this particular series of projects is that you've taken almost in the cartoon sense an identifiable figure of a house and use that as the point of departure, the point of the thing with which to disintegrate and set up the other inventions again. And it's very obvious thing to say. But um, I think many of us probably fall into a trap in the making of objects that disintegrate, or objects that suggest that there is either conceptual integration of the initial object is very complicated. And therefore that would be recognized before the second game can take place. And I think for me this is the it may be a very simple aspect of the work, but it's it's the thing which was I tried to incorporate so that the so-called house would become a catalyst to sort of project external forces like the wind or the sun or the landscape, whatever they are, through the house. So the house became more or less, like as I showed yesterday, the image of, of Le Lusas with the sun, where the landscape is actually projected like through a, through a lens. And, and the, the house actually, as a theme, starts to do that. And, but it's dealt all with external landscapes, with the actual horizon, the, the juxtaposition of horizon. <coughs> while all the landscapes are all sort of internalized, compressed to the almost the, the total man. I, I, this was actually at the time when I discovered uh, Mach, when, this, when I talked yesterday about the polarity of physical geometric space. On one hand, in the walls, you always have a framed vertical, it's almost like the horizontal horizon. 
is tilted up and cuts the landscape. As it becomes a device, almost a dangerous device. While you see, you also touch. The passages are so, so narrow that you always have, at the same time, simultaneously, a physical sensation with the visual sensation, which actually takes place anyhow. It was Mark was continuously talking about. We cannot have visual perception without uh, feeling uh, physiological sensations. But coming back to the, to the disintegration, I really wouldn't call it disintegration. It's more or less, for me, a collision where two elements collide and more or less <coughs> like in a fusion or explosion create a new structure. Maybe in the most reduced sense it was the chair. The chair was maybe the starting point where I discovered that. In the chair, very different from this series, I only I discovered a non-physical element or property of the chair which was the axis. There's no physical properties. And just by cutting, actually there's no reduction in that sense, it's just a splitting. You create a complete different relationship of the chair and the chair with the body. And of course... So decay doesn't enter into it, right? Not really. No, I don't believe really... I mean, decay in a sense... You see, I wondered whether you made some decay between <coughs> something that decomposes, you know. Yes, but I... And that I, you would I, welcome this. Right. No, I welcome it... To but the in point a, where sort of eventually there wouldn't be anything there at all. No, I'm not interested in that. No. No, I'm, in that sense, I'm very conservative. Actually, I've become more conservative uh, as older I get. Conservative in the sense that I accept definite limitations of the language I'm talking with. Yeah. So, well, I'm interested in decay, but as a structure decay. That means you, in anticipation, that how you construct, you can anticipate how it collapses. I mean, yes, would you huh? welcome so, something that decomposes? Yes, so like for example, the last one with the fragment, this gate seven, yes. uh, is actually a frozen <coughs> composition of where elements have started to leave the structure, but then sort of stop to leave it, like the thing is projected out, makes a hole, again, from a similar uh, theme like in the chair, mm -hmm. huh? the negative and positive uh, juxtaposition. In the chair, though, you allowed it to distort, whereas I noticed that none of the actual um, elements are, the, the actual plane or the actual surface doesn't distort, it cracks, or it is removed, or it is cut, there's collision, but not distortion. Yeah, but that was something that, that struck me yesterday, looking at it, because I was looking for signs of distortion, because to me, what interests me about uh, the whole melting thing, or whatever, is the distortion. Uh, and then the fine, the, the, the kind of uh, point at which distortion occurs to the destruction of the original <coughs> thing and doesn't. Yeah. But, but clearly this doesn't interest you. No, it doesn't interest me at all. I mean, I, I'm not interested in a so-called decaying or disintegration process which I have no control over. Just, I'm not interested simply in the sensation of that act. I'm interested in the act itself as long as I have a method intellectual method of controlling it, that I still deal, that what I would call conservative in a sense, no? that you still have a, a structural rationale. And this is really, I, I would say, one of the limitations of architecture. I think when you leave that, and you touch upon borderlines. At least, I mean, I'm really talking about, I try to avoid to, as I pointed out yesterday, I try to avoid to present a dogmatic theory. It's really only, theory interests me only, except for gossip reasons, of course, but uh, otherwise it only interests me for my own work. Sort of like it's a, it's a polemic interchange of discovery, rediscovery, work, and so on. That's why you prefer other people to write about. Yeah, yeah of course, write, yes, so. yes, yes, very much so. Why do you have no drawing for gate seven? Because I was unable to complete it, I see. There were some people who were asking me actually at the opening and they expected some, uh, some uh, conceptual uh, gimmick behind, but there is really not. When I, when I submitted the project to Venice, uh, I only had five drawings, as four drawings only. And one drawing I was able to complete there for the opening. There were still, at the opening there were two empty. Then I completed another one and hung it up during the, the show and now this one is left. I'm not sure if I completed everything.
but say, I, I'm not sure if I assume that you, you did this intentionally to contribute to the gossip. No, 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 I do it. No, no. No, I really don't. I mean, I would have been happy to have it. I mean, but yeah, for me, it's very painful to work. You see, I mean, it's not painful. Painful is to start. See, when I, I get very unhappy. I have periods that work in very intense periods, very short periods. I haven't done any project since I came back from, from Europe. It was in September until now. I haven't done anything. And now I get slowly depressed, and I sort of like it pushes me toward working again. And so there was, there's no concept. I mean, I, I just started very late, and it, as usual, it, as you know, it always takes much longer than you anticipate if you establish a certain standard. So that was really all. And it, so the exhibitions or competitions in earlier days were, for me, almost necessary to push me to a completion, give me a due date. So I have to complete it, otherwise, I mean, I could, you can work, I did that very, actually, for my pace, very, very fast, in terms of production of, of the actual work. I mean, for, for the, the drawing, uh, the house with curtains, which is, is also in color, is actually larger than, than it is there. Uh, it took me about two and a half to three months, I think it was, it was finished. The changing and drawing over and over again, so actually, in that respect, those were that much, much faster. Going back to what Peter said about that, the, this not being as one-off as the house. Yeah. Do you find that, that doing a, a series, I mean, how is that in terms of um, developing the idea and for each one having something particular to that to say about? Yeah. The thing is that see, the difference between conceiving the house of that rooms in this series is quite different. Mm -hmm. This was really uh, I was going to a turning point. Whether it was a natural progression. It was natural in the sense that here was actually a program given, so to speak. Yeah. A metaphoric program. It was said that uh, uh, suburban alternatives. No? Yeah. And out of more or less my investigation what I would, how I would interpret the phenomena of the suburb, it's sort of a combination, the archetype I chose has a little bit of also of a stone house somewhere in the, in the Tyrolean Alps, combined with sort of like the monolithic quality of, of a suburban American house. Actually, the first, the first uh, view of America I had when I, when I arrived in the airplane, it was a very low, low ceiling of clouds, and so the plane penetrated the clouds, the first thing I saw of America was the suburb of Long Island. And it was one of the most monumental experiences I ever had. Oh. This, 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 uh, the manifestation of single houses. See? You immediately sensed there was something very peculiar about that. And all of a sudden I sort of remembered this, you know, which was all very monumental to me. So there was a, a very natural uh, discovery, rediscovery of that, of that fact. Yeah. It was not at all like a, in, I didn't conceive it as a com in a in a how did you say a um, uh, like a comic strip or like a uh, cartoon. It was not intended at all to be uh, satirical at all. Yeah. It was really more or less a, a a serious a serious attempt of making those two things those two worlds collide. What I said yesterday, <coughs> like the indigenous one and the intentional one. And there were also stages of like how the, the archetype, which I chose, became transformed in the first stage. It was encased and filled inside. The, the, the interesting thing in my work is I always anticipate uh, how it actually could be done. Mm -hmm. Even if I'm not interested in doing it, but I always somehow anticipate the, the physicalization or materialization of the actual thing. So you could fill it with foam, there's now you know, high density foam where you can actually fill the whole interior of, the, of an existing house with foam and then case it on the outside with you know, metal or concrete mm -hmm. right? as the first to neutralize it for, before it, had, it receives the collision of the, new, of the new thing. And the car, of course, was also another, another element which, which is very natural in the in American suburb. I mean, the car together with the house almost forms very uh, strange monumental uh, uh, compositions. 
I don't know if you read this the text I have in this little brochure. There's this this small text by Charles Olson, who is do you know Olson? He died about five years. He was, I, I consider him after Pound the most uh, important American poet, I mean at least in the last twenty years. And uh, this this poem about this going back visiting his mother in the suburb and about he tried to push his car, to get his car started, which he hadn't seen for, I don't know, 10 years. And all of a sudden, so, I mean, metaphorically, the car was over him, above him. And then, listen, I used the car, again, I discovered the poem afterwards. That's, again, the same sort of theoretical game. But the car, in that sense, is the entrances in all my houses go down into the earth because I want the sensation of the horizon that you actually <coughs> perceive the disappearance. I don't want to penetrate. I mean, first of all, it, it, it started with all my other houses are very fragile in the sense they have glass skins, and so you never can really uh, make a hole in them. So you go in the earth and then enter and then re emerge. In that sense, you go down, but the car can actually park over that entrance and can become the gate. See, like in a, like the, in a, uh, in a um, uh, service station, the pit. But then mechanics go down and the mechanics above. Why do you have Yoko Ono sitting on your chair? That's not Yoko Ono. Looks like She's much more interesting than Scott. Yeah. Well, this girl was a model in, uh, in Rhode, Island, Rhode Island School of Design. She's exactly like Yoko Ono. Oh, she's about uh, two heads taller than Yoko Ono. That's it. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just wanted to point out that Yoko Ono would have interested me yeah. Yeah. for that. that <coughs> Can, on a completely different tack, really, um, in the business of being a teacher, you've been a teacher the whole time you've been in America, more or less, I guess. Yeah, which is true. Quite, yeah. You know, it's a long time. It's a long time. Mm -hmm. and, and your work has been known, I guess, <coughs> to most of your students during that time. Um, I doubt that. Yeah. Well, anyhow, of, yeah. the, of the last, let's say, five years. Yeah. 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 And um, I wonder if this, if, if the two activities in your mind, <coughs> to what extent they cut off and to what extent they, they interrelate, in the sense that do you get very embarrassed or irritated if your own students, I mean your regular students, start asking you the sort of questions that we might be asking you today. No, I mean, um, I never do. You, my do you find certain but things which they are doing um, stimulate you, not necessarily in a direct sense, but are in some ways either continuations of things that you've done, taking off, or... I mean, you know, this whole business of the business, the, the whole business of <coughs> doing work at the same period of time that you're teaching yes. to students who are sophisticated and very... <coughs> self-conscious of these things, you yourself may be conscious of their self-consciousness and your own. How do you feel about this whole thing? I think it's more... You know, the, the, the autumn, and, and the other thing sort of related to that um, is this business of doing work under a certain kind of spotlight that you know damn well now that anything that you expose, I mean, unless it's something you do and tear up or suppress, but you are increasingly conscious of the spotlight. Uh, really, when I teach, I'm not at all. I mean, first of all, as you know, I was always, I mean, my exposure of my work in the, in the last 10 years was minimal in terms of magazines or whatever. Absolutely, I mean, I'm paranoid about that. I mean, I, if I get, get a letter from a magazine, tell them to send him work, it takes me about a year even to write a letter back. It is somehow this is my writing paranoia, whatever. I mean, it's, I don't appreciate it, but it's the fact. So this is really no issue. I think, but it's, it, there's an interesting phenomenon. When I started to teach very naively, when I came to this country, um, I taught at Rhode Island School of Design the second year, I remember. And somehow, of course, I, I exposed to the students everything I know, um, everything I, you know. And, and so all of a sudden, it was a sensation of success. Students made fantastic projects, and people had never seen it done. And, and I was very happy. And then the second year, the same students went to somebody else and produced pure shit. And so I started, the first time I started to think about teaching. Before, I mean, it wasn't even an issue for me. And 
And uh, so I discovered that the only thing really you can teach is to make people aware of, well, develop a confidence in them and the necessity to focus really, or more or less really reduce the whole theoretical framework of simple issues and let them grow with them. You know? and, and this is sort of like I, I, what I enjoy in teaching is more or less the dialogue. Not so much influence. I'm not interested in influence whatsoever. But yes, of course, you cannot avoid it. But like, you must remember yeah. that you've had students that have sort of almost grown with you, as it were. There's some, there's even, there, I teach in schools. I mean, those Peter and I know so much that we're very aware of our future and all the work. tended not to be those that were particularly doing your thing. I mean, I've always found it so. Yeah, so but, oh, well, but, I was thinking of sort of people like Chris Dawson and Tony Dovedale. The worst of the people were the certain people. But I think they are people in a slightly different... I think that sort of role suits a certain period, you know, that, that they're, they're oh, yeah, what I call depend dependence. Whereas well, what yeah. Raymond's talking about... I realise I was talking about sort of 500 years ago, but nevertheless, one was conscious then. And so I am today. Where I'm just known as Mark. I never had that problem. So. <laughs> 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 ah, except Raymond, I'm, yeah. I'm always, I mean, just to so twist that up. Five years ago or something. Do you find being Austrian is, is a, an irritation? It's like even yesterday when I introduced you for the benefit of you know, the back who read the program or something. I go through this bit about you. I mean, yeah. do, do you find that now a kind of unnecessary uh, piece of baggage? It doesn't. As in America, it doesn't exist. It doesn't, doesn't exist. I must this is, this is, uh, yes. Guy with the yeah. yeah. I mean, people are not really, I mean, I don't think so. Maybe some students, it all depends on the students. If they are, if they are on a, on a history trip or so, of course, they're probably interested in that, in the phenomenon. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, I don't feel it. had something there when, when you first went to Rhode Island. Oh yeah, then it was different, sure. It was used as a tool. Yeah, of course. Are you saying, Peter, that the history of the immediate past is no longer relevant? No, I'm saying that that proposed this business of, of one's own work and its relationship to the influence or effect upon students, I think it, it, it varies. Um, and I think there are certain kinds of situations where there is a dependency of what one does. Personally, I don't find it as interesting as the thing that Raymond did. There is a dialogue which, in a very roundabout sense, has to do with what you do. May, you may realize it. Um, but I still think that, um, that 
you, you know, there are people who teach in architecture schools who hardly produce anything at all, you know, who are just, so maybe they're regular guys and they teach quite well, but you can never actually say they do that they're, they're teaching. Whereas as soon as you, you are attached to a series of things that you have produced, I think it does preempt certain conversations on the part of a lot of students. I think you, you can't help but be in, feel uh, that, that it is there also, at the back of your mind. And certainly if one, one can make a very trite comment on looking at some of the Cooper work, one can say, who could have possibly encouraged, certainly not discouraged, this kind of work happening? Must have been Raymond. Who else is yeah, there that could not have... Yeah, but you see, that's not, that's, I mean, sure it happens. And Cooper, for example, is a phenomenon that Cooper maybe was a, a, a little bit too tight academically seen, you know, when I arrived. So now it's a more open climate, which not only has to do with my influence, also that Hayduck got more open. And so the students felt a sense of liberation. Hmm? And of course, they, and this is a kind of like this drawing sensibility, so it's all over now. You know, it's not so, so local anymore. And so this is very natural, it happens. But I, I don't think this is that important. What I try to do is to encourage really, I don't even accept a class or a group. I really am very consistent with my philosophy that I believe in, in, in this kind of, a, of an anarchy that each student could, should develop his own more or less uh, work and theoretical framework. So I really try to encourage, try to find out what the student is all about, what he can do, what his idea is, and try to crystallize that idea. That's really all I'm interested in. Actually, I'm always looking forward to, uh, to see something I've never seen before. Mm -hmm. For me, the ultimate uh, joy would be to see a project that I get jealous about, and not something that, that I can recognize. Um, excuse me. Yeah. Um, going back to something Peter was mentioning about you being Austrian, um, I don't really, being an American, uh, don't really see very much of an American kind of image in your work. I would say it's distinctly un-American in its sort of sensibility, in its, its sense of, uh, you know, excuse me, sort of the uh, banal about it. You're saying, I mean, Americans don't have that sense of sort of being able to evoke images. I mean, it has to be there for them to sort of... Uh, Oh, I wouldn't say that. That's, I wouldn't say that. Certainly not in the suburb. No, but I said it yesterday, and I meant it very, very honestly, that one can never escape the culture he emerges from. So, I mean, I, Austrian in that sense is just whatever childhood memories, whatever memories you have. It has really not something to do with a definite, historically definable cultural context, which you call Austrian. Hmm. See, it's, it's, it's much more complex than that, or, or simpler than that. It has to do really, as I mentioned, like this, it's, it's very interesting that like, like Bichler, Peintner, all come from the mountains. I mean, there are very few, Holland is the only Viennese of the whole, of the whole group of, of, of the circle of architects. All, everybody else, I mean, this is the, before, in the, during the monarchy, uh, uh, Vienna was the melting pot for, for Czechoslovakia and for Hungary and so on. Eh? And then it got, so it shrunk to Austria itself. But still, the provinces now be became the sort of the feeding, the feeding uh, uh, regions. But this was 10, 15 years ago. Now it has totally changed anyhow. Now it's, no, it's not even a melting pot anymore. Maybe to sort of finish up, um, you know, what kind of images, I mean, do you think of the kind of images that you're talking about, the fragmentation and, uh, I really like to, uh, I forgot what his name was. I mean, they're really slicing through. Are they sort of potentially American images? In your mind? I mean, but see, well, I mean, it's I, yeah, okay. Is that the kind of thing that, that you would sort of espouse to a, um, a student at Cooper Union? The, I'm not, I don't analyze the most intimate spheres of my life, I never analyze. I like relationship with people or relationship to my work, I don't analyze. I'm fully aware, I'm fully conscious of what they mean in terms of a formal construct I'm interested to visualize. 
But I am not interested at all in any kind of psychological interpretation, where they come from or what generated them. Because it would be senseless. I mean, it even would destroy the whole... I, be, I really believe in a certain... in a, uh, retaining a certain myth in life. That what, what when Tony was talking about, we were talking about yesterday about the indigenous and the uh, intention. He said there are certain things in between which are not clear. Of course not. Why should they? Uh, they I mean, if everything is clear, then you eliminate the, the essence of life, which is a dialectic relation, which is there are certain things which are not explainable, or that you shouldn't explain. No, I mean, I agree. But, I mean, so that's, that's uh, certainly the, the valuable thing that, that I mean, uh, people like the New York Five who are bringing a European influence to American architecture are doing. It's reinvesting it. Now. Yeah, but see, you have to be careful because the whole piece of the New York Five and so was masterminded by a publicity conscious man. Yeah. And those people in there, they're all very different people. And now they are very uh, eager to get out of that thing, mm -hmm. despite the fact they all profited actually from the publicity. Huh? But it was, see, that's where you have to be careful. If you, feed, if you eat that, what's presented to you, then all of a sudden you make no distinction between Richard Meyer and John Haydick. But they are worlds, they are worlds apart. Worlds apart. And there's a certain affinity, as affinity in the way I draw, or the way Bichler draws, or some other people draw. There's affinity which has to do with sensibility. There's a similar sensibility. But when you look closer, then the ideas are totally different. <coughs> so that was, I mean, the whole gimmick of this, of the Five Architects was to present this book and actually choose projects which look very similar. I mean, you're fully aware of that. And then, but if you know the work, well, then it doesn't make sense at all. Then the whole thing would collapse. Yeah, no, what I, was, I was just sort of, was, uh, yeah, I, I appreciate that pretty fully. Yeah. What I was talking about was, was the fact that they have some, very much more sort of, a, well, I mean, certainly their prototypes are European. And certainly most of the other people in America are not looking at European prototypes. And, and I'm just trying to sort of uh, feel out for you what, what you would sort of infect into America I and mean, if you could bring your sort of Pandora's box over? Yeah, if you, you would speculate about that, maybe the interesting thing is that, let's say, let's take the New York, so the New York Five, just as, as an example. They all departed from European concepts. They all European theories they adopted. Uh, and of course, it became by America. Not anyone in Europe right, made things like that influenced by straightforward European uh, documentations. But maybe uh, where I come from Europe, uh, and maybe it has changed in a sense since I came to America, but I'm not aware of that. I'm really not aware. I mean, you are you are, uh, interested in those kind of speculations. Uh, that's I think I'm always interested in them, not, not just in their own worse, but because of the, the dynamic that's set up. I mean, my only reason for asking questions, for instance, about relationship to your own work, to teaching, uh, is not to make an example of it particularly, but because there is a dynamic set up. I mean, it seems to me that um, as soon as you start loosening, having a loosening influence, if you want to call it no more than that, upon yeah. paper, you have a, at least an int you know, you have at least a base of some, of some worth before you even get there. Yes. The loose, it, and it's, it's a strong enough place to take that kind of loosening, whereas you could drive in onto another school that was, was inherently very weak and start loosening it and the whole thing fall apart. Now that's, an, or if we talk about the business of exposure, you know, it's business manipulation by one person. The business even of making an exhibition. I mean, what, what often strikes me as, as almost ludicrous is the relationship between a thing which purports to be a representation of another object. I mean, it's very difficult territory here because, in a sense, these things are so beautiful in their own right. You don't need to, as you were sort of implying, you don't need to build a building. Yet, nevertheless, their tradition is that they are representations of a larger object, which would be a building, and that a building is a maybe functioning object. Yet, we all know, sitting in this room, that, that 
in no way are they necessarily there. But only the business business of business, of a model, yeah, no? But the business of an exhibition is a ludicrous kind of situation. You know, like um, it, 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 it has grown up by a curious set of circumstances that it is convenient for one month to place the work in a place where, as you could say, well, it need only be there for sufficient time that one group of people can see it. Sure. The lecture, the like you tried last night to break one of the strangleholds of the lecture, which is that it has to have this burbling on whilst you show the images. Even so, uh, you agree to sit more or less in the front of the room, etc. I mean, one can think of all these examples. The only real interest in the final analysis is what, to me, is what they cause, whether they prompt other people to do things, whether they extend the state of the art, if you like. Um, and I think that then it becomes interesting whether somebody is being manipulated, whether it was useful or not for the five to be together, and all this crap that you didn't like a year ago when I said, you know, the New York scene, what fascinated me about it, and still fascinates me, is that um, <coughs> per person, the New York circumstance, let's call it, is very good at creating a hype. It's very good at creating hype, even about third-rate, fifth-rate people, in, in addition to the first-rate people. And London is very bad about creating this particular kind of hype. Now, this has advantages, disadvantages. And, and for me, it is, it is healthy for London to be at least conscious of what New York is about, just as hopefully the reverse is true. You know. And then I think one reaches discussions about um, cause and effect, you know, it, 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 it. But they never I, I wasn't exaggerating, for instance, when I said yesterday that, that you may clear the ground for Bernard Chumi to do three years of running a unit at the A, which was definably different from other units that had been before. Now, he isn't doing your kind of work, but when you, Mike, and Friedrich came, was, in my memory of the A, a sort of watershed point. You know, it, maybe it needed three guys, maybe it needed a certain album was fresh to the game, etc., etc. A whole lot of coincidences. And it made it possible for a whole lot of funny people, Bernard Schumi and, and Leon van Schaik and, and uh, uh, I've forgotten his name, Graham Shane, people of that generation, to, to wobble on in other directions. You guys had been at it longer and came across with a very strong impact, I remember the three of you. It, and it wasn't noticeable in the immediate sort of days afterwards, it took sort of a year or two. And that's, that to me is a sort of cultural event. It's, it's, it's kind of well, running on for years. But I think that's, that's really natural. I, I would say that anybody who has enough uh, like a courage and perseverance and obsession with his own work uh, produces certain uh, or inspirations. It, this is very natural. I think um, this is. But on the other hand, the work itself or the production of the work is a total separate, isolated process. And everything which comes afterwards is, as I said yesterday, it's all uh, secondary. It's a, you know, it's it becomes phenomenological. I mean, you cannot control it anymore. And it also it, it reflects all weaknesses you actually have, all the temptations that you actually you hate exhibitions but you show anyhow or whatever you know. They, I mean, this is all. I would say if you want, would cut that off, then you become a, a, a purist. You know, and, and <coughs> might, then it might really start to negatively influence your work. I think there is really this kind of of a, the paradox. It's, it's, it's a very beautiful story of him. <coughs> Uh, described uh, Duchamp uh, not letting Man Ray scratching off the women's silver. I thought it was it was very natural, but Hamilton didn't didn't think so. Hamilton thought it was crazy that it was you know. And this is sort of like this this the paradox which which makes any any communication was it possible that it doesn't become academic or or formal, but rather when you don't think about it immediately, you just go away and then something comes out of it, or maybe not.
do you, do you turn off some of your things as soon as your fetch is finished? I mean, do you get very noticeably less disinterested as soon as the actual thing is finished? Yes, I would say so. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you indulge in more or less in a certain time and, in, you know, being satisfied of having it completed and, of course, if I wouldn't be satisfied, I wouldn't show them. So, I mean, there's a certain dialogue between the work and yourself, but after a while it doesn't really, it doesn't interest me. Only if it becomes then again a vehicle for discussion. Then, then it's, it's like, then, then you can almost open up infinite number of dimensions. But I'm still uh, maintaining the sort of the, 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 the knowledge that it has nothing to do with the work itself. The work, actually, one doesn't even know, I mean, we, we know that as well as I do. When you produce a work, you're not all the time aware what causes that. And this is a... It often gets worse than sure, you are. Sure. Oh, yeah, okay, it gets worse than you are. This would be the other extreme where you actually work according to a theory. Mm. Well, that's, that's the whole, I mean, that's the whole dilemma. Right? That's, you can watch people who started to do that. Actually, they tell, Ventura is one of the, of, the, of the examples for me, who, who is, uh, in fact, a very, very talented architect. And, and he consciously decided uh, to cut off his creativity uh, in preference to a theory. What do you think would have happened? I mean, you came second in, with, with Friedrich in the, in the Bobo competition. What do you think would have happened if you'd won it? A disaster. It would be an absolute disaster. <laughs> <laughs> was, actually, I did have a, a slide. No, the first scheme, I, I built a little, I have one slide left, a little cardboard model. And this was a very, sort of, it was a, a, a plain, sort of like, you would take a, the site and would flip it up. And it had, had a certain depth, but it was cut very sharply to contain whatever there was. It opened up a sort of a, an open belly, its intestines, to, to the lower, lower parts. And everybody was very excited about that. And so this was this, the, the, the scheme. And then in the process, when some students built a site model, then we put it in. And then it looked very, I mean, very monumental. And somehow, I was very mellow, and I couldn't take it. As, so so then Frederick was actually fighting it. You know, that was really my idea. And I started to cut it down, and we made it sort of really humble, you know, sort of functional looking. And all of a sudden, it looked like, a, I don't know, sort of like a, a soft coffee idea. Yeah. <laughs> and I haven't seen it since. But do you think you'd have survived the actual sort of atheism or hypnotism? Of, of, uh, competition making. Of, no, of actually building a large building in Paris. Oh yes, the, yeah. that's. I mean, you could never do. I mean, the Niagara Falls project, which is a larger project, which I built, which I have built in association with an office. Otherwise, it would be absolutely impossible. I mean, I watched this process. I mean, to build in America, I, mean, I don't know how it is here, but the problem to build in America is that of of coping with liability. It's all designed to, to, I mean, everyone try to screw the other one. Right? <laughs> so you make, uh, you draw plans, which cost you half a million dollars, right? and you sell it working drawings. So it's all consultants, whatever. They are, I mean, you can build it blind. <laughs> then you give it to the contractor, and the contractor just bids on those drawings. Right? Then the, the selected contractor makes his own drawings, which are lousy drawings. <laughs> And they come back to you and to all consultants, just for the simple reason that you have to double check and if you overlook a tiny little detail, right? He has a legal case. Yeah. So this is how it goes. <laughs> Before we get, I mean, if the, the architect does not answer letter at the right time, I mean, you know, you have a legal case. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it, I mean, it would, if you would be responsible for a process like that, it would, I mean, you would be destroyed so in half a year. But you were saying yesterday that at least for some stuff, for example, the half of the uh, curtains, yeah. you are not really interested in. I would not in, in building. Not only interested, I would be very uh, anxious not to. And I, it. Yeah, and I, I must say, when when I, I came out to England last year for two years, and I, I saw you were around here at uh, uh, the AA, I can't remember, and I, you know, one of the things which I can remember you shown was. 
uh, curtains and then da, 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 did ne Niagara for something. And yeah. I was extremely disappointed by that build thing. Because when, once you build a thing, it loses all sort of the aura. And you, you're saying, you know, you, you are on the way, or you, you try to keep the myth or the aura, or at least, well, you try not, not to lose it. You even try to create no, it. No, it's not that it, it, it has a different, uh, the build has a different reality as the drawn. So actually, the build should be seen built <coughs> as the drawn can be seen drawn. Okay? Do, I mean, you could not, I mean, that's the interesting phenomena is that most of the historic architecture I know, I only know from photographs. So which reveals actually less information as the drawing does. Yeah? And you accept it fully as, as that, as the reality of that particular architecture. Nobody doubts that. Because there's somehow the knowledge it's built. But built thing, what, what... You can be very... Oh yes, of course. Like, uh, I actually walked like many, many times. So many times. Right <coughs> oh yes. Oh, that was incredible. Recently, I went to the, the first time to so the falling water. I tell you this story. It's incredible. Yes. Falling water has been always shown from from below, right. you know, with candle. Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> when you arrive there, the most beautiful view is actually the back. Yeah. It comes to the to the. Uh, very beautiful uh, trees, and then in the distance everything is a little bit gray, it's floating, a very pure uh, cubic position. And then all of a sudden you see details, and you cannot believe it. When you cannot, it's like built out of chocolate. Mm -hmm. When the details like a uh, out of rocks, anything, and they are covered, concrete beams, and they are covered with some kind of of uh, stucco, and the stucco sort of looks like it's, it's smeared around the edge. I mean, it's all over the place. Like. And Raymond, was he a little man? Huh? I mean, I remember going to that. I don't know. <laughs> he always looks very tall in photographs. Tall tower, what's it called? I went to that. And the, the price tower, is it? Yeah. Yeah. The price. Oh, yeah, it's all, yeah. It's all compressed. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, you feel as though it's made for children. <laughs> Yeah. And I always imagine this magnificent sort of skyscraper. Yeah, too. And I have often wondered whether Frank Lloyd Wright was a little guy. No, I maybe mean, it was the other thing. Maybe he wanted he wanted other people to feel small. <laughs> that's all. I think that's maybe true. I think, I think he was rather tall. Yeah, he was no, he was not. He was short. He was short. Yes. Yes. Really? That's fantastic. From photographs, I always imagine because he always was very this monumental. Yeah, I think he was on this building. So I see. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, well, I think the rooms are six feet high, and these are what people built for over six feet. He designed it because he was short and he wanted to feel tall. Yes, yes, yes. So, I mean, there's this different, to come back to the aura, of course, there's a different aura. Yeah, but see, uh -huh. the Walter Benjamin was writing in 1928 or something rather. Like you know, the, the, the loss of the aura in the industrial age, something, you know, that with the process of reproduction, the uh, originality of, of your drawing, for example, would, you know, would, <coughs> go, would, would go away. So, no, you have to be a very, very reactionary thing. I mean, I, I like the aura. No, I understand the argument. You, you believe that I don't want to build this because I'm afraid it loses aura. Mm -hmm. No, it's not true. There's, in this house, it's very important that the curtains fly. The, the curtains are sort of limp on the glass. Right. So it would be, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> see, that's what I want to see. No, so it's not the aura. It's a very simple thing. It's a simple phenomenon. You, you just have something. I want to. I want the curtains <laughs> permanently fly. If I would know a site where the wind would blow all the time, I would build it. <laughs> but nevertheless, even on between uh, drawing and model, there is a similarity of of um, atmosphere about the two representations. Yeah, this is an interesting question. Yeah, like and a presumably a continuation of that through to the built form, if ever, that the magic of the successful magic of an architect mm -hmm. is in, is in I mean, getting back to this thing yesterday, I mean, is in actually translating the sketch <coughs> the drawing of the model into the building so that they all read 
Excuse me. Siri. Could I put it for uh, one second? second. Yeah. That's a minute. Uh, um, when you finish the tomatoes, the water has to totally <laughs> disappear. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Yeah, yeah, here's one. <laughs> I wondered which came, did you do the model after? Parallel. Mm -hmm. I did them at the same time. They so changed each other. Simultaneously. They changed each other. But the thing is that the question is very interesting because for me, it is the, the, a very basic misunderstanding in architects' views about dimensionality. I mean, two, three dimension. See, like a building is more three dimensional than a drawing. Because three dimension is a a strategy of defining mathematically or geometrically points in space, which is, a, is an invention of man. So it has nothing to do with physics. It's purely a context, which you can demonstrate in any way. You can write about it, you can draw it, or you can build it. But what happens when you build, you introduce physical presence. It means what I was talking yesterday about Mark's discovery of the physiological qualities of that. So the model is has a physiological presence, mm -hmm. hmm? while the drawing has a different presence. The drawing is this yeah. flat, it has its transparent. The model, it, you can have its good side, you know? Sure. Well, Actually, the, the, the so an isometric... So you can have on a, on a, on a, yes, on a three I mean, a projected drawing, you can have a good side and a bad. No, it's not three really dimensions. Like I mean, no, I know, but I mean, on, on an isometric, isometric perspective, you can always select. Yeah, perspective is something else, but an isometric line, if you look at this, or any of those isometrics, they are cutaways. No? So what they, they uh, do, they provide simultaneous experiences, which the model does not, because you have to go around, you see? If you want to see this thing, you have to go around to look. But that's the, so, I mean, but that's the point, I mean, that's, that is a pre-selected approach. I want yourself. to see. Yeah, yeah, of course. To yourself, yes. 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 Because that maybe is the, that is what interests you. Sure. sure. So why don't you build a model like that? I mean, the model. Why? Don't, I mean, why? Maybe. Why isn't the model? Yes. A cutaway. Or why isn't the model blank on the side? That. Yeah, but this will be a decision made really on the spot. No, I know. But I, mean, I look at it and I say, I want to see that. that. I just want to see yeah. that. So I cut out the little hole so you can see it. Yeah. There's one quality about it. I mean, I'm just thinking about this Americanness, non-Americanness in the Austrian thing. There's one sort of quality which I, I call sort of spooky or tarnished tones or something. I mean, there's some very difficult to find a word for it, but there is an identifiable, really non-Americanness about both the models and the drawings and most of the er earlier things I've seen of yours, which. I just cannot Im imagine an American not wanting to clean them up somehow, not wanting to use... Oh no, then you have a, a wrong impression of Americans. Well, I mean, I am yet... To but maybe it's New York, because New York maybe then is not America. No, I, I would go along with that in terms of... There's something spooky art. that's still... There's a very different, different, great difference between pop art in England and pop art in New York. No, of course, sure. And the linear, I mean, there's certainly a, a certain kind of line which now is beginning to be copied by some Italians and even, dare I say, some English, etc., Germans maybe, but at one point was only being done <coughs> on that connection. You know, that, yeah, that yeah, it's yeah. not important, yeah. but it's curious how it does affect the thing. It's, it's to do with the delineation or not delineation of an edge. It's to do with a certain <coughs> kind of choice of color. I think, I mean, I just sort of have a suspicion that even this dropping the thing into the top, <coughs> implying embedding in ground, is, is related to that connection. Maybe, now you can argue that this isn't really central, because maybe it isn't, but it, it helps. I can't explain why. Yeah, it sure. helps. See, and I'm intrigued to see whether um, you know there will be in three, five years' time a curious sort of metamorphosis of, of not your work but of a, of a third generation who are Americans, and this is why Cooper is interesting, who are affected by this 
but also of course just as much affected by other cultural things. Um, but is it basically for now? Which is, which is for, for local reasons, why it's very important to, to kind of, like this week, run you to death to have you giving quote unquote a, a public lecture sitting in front of your thing. But so it doesn't bother me. It does really doesn't bother me. Because um, okay. it, it's, 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 to me, what's interesting is what happens in three years' time. You know, it's, it's some funny, curious way it will maybe get into other bloodstreams. But I think some of the traditional, the way they describe the, the, the drawing or the sensibility, the graphic sensibility, is really not that Austrian. It's really fundamentally European. I mean, it's, it's more tradition in Italy, Renaissance, Leonardo da Vinci uh, kind of sensibility. And the interesting thing at Cooper is that students, since there are many courses taught, you know, sort of to establish historic continuity, they're fully aware of that heritage. And a lot of people, you know, uh, we go to the studios, they have books there, you know, not contemporary architecture books, or, but rather looking at paintings uh, yeah. from the uh, 1500s. Yeah. So it's, it's this kind of, it's much deeper, their interest in developing sort of like this co historic continuity, which is maybe uh, happening there, not because here, or especially in Italy, where it happens, right? In Italy, you have just the opposite uh, happening now in architecture schools that they are more interested in discussing Marxist uh, 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 issues yeah. than, uh, than to look, I mean, in Venice, for example, where you are surrounded by the most, you know, pragmatic architecture. Nobody gives a shit. Everybody is, is talking about uh, politics. Mm. So this is maybe, because also New York, is New York is of course different than any other place, is, is maybe the most old-fashioned city that, and maybe getting more old-fashioned every year. There's no progress in the technological sense. It's truly old-fashioned. That's why you don't, you're never conscious of being an Austrian or not. It doesn't matter. It absolutely does not matter. Because there's, there's so much influx of different, different uh, people and interests that it's, it's just a place, a, very, a, very, a place where you feel comfortable. That's why I described yesterday this climate which the Institute creates, which doesn't affect New York, but if you are aware, at least have connections to the circles, that it's just, it works against the spirit of the city. It, it tries to, to, that's what I escaped from Vienna when I left. It's really happening now there. And we in that the circles no? of, of, of trying so much to to control certain aspects of development. Yeah, for the collision. Which is much more interesting than, than the, to create the, the illusion of a perspective space. So this is a very basic, this is a basic thing in other words. This, 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 this is what I mean, is that's where I like theory. When I read a book and all of a sudden I discover affinities which confirm something which I had intuitively felt in the work. And so it keeps going. So you develop the thing in parallel, in parallel fashion. I think that you have poetry in your book. And these houses, or what remains of them, seem to be built on a sandy plateau this corroding way, and you have a feeling that the actual land on which they are is corroding away quicker than the buildings. And I notice at the end they're actually sinking. No, but that's more or less your own <coughs> interpretation. My, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the way I conceived it was really simple that I wanted to cut away. I was very interested in the lot. Mm. I looked at some books, sort of from the 40s, there were a lot of books uh, dealing with. Uh, suburban designs. Uh, so, like, they gave the walls and there were 500 samples. And one intriguing thing is the lot size. The, it's very, it almost doesn't vary, it's 50 by 150 or something like that. So, that's what I wanted to show that the house and the lot forms an archetypical situation, and the category one is showing that it is metaphorically an island. It's yeah. cut out yeah, of the exactly. earth and becomes it, a. It looks as though there was a sea around it, and you have cliffs. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I know it's not intended. Yeah. I'm looking at it. No, but see, there's, there's, there's one thing that this poetic business, there's, there's uh, now. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a bad word. I no, no, I know, but it's actually used uh, in, in that sense. Like, uh, uh, 
Gandhisonists, no? who invented now the new terms of neo-realism, neo-functionalism, uh, tries now to classify work as, as practical architecture, which I absolutely despise. No? Because, I mean, poetics is, is, is somehow, there's a certain... I wasn't referring to that. No, 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 I know. I'm not accusing you. I'm just sort of like memorized that, that this is sort of like a tendency now when you run out of, uh, of isms, when you uh, sort of refer to, uh, to, to poetry. Right? Saying to, to come back to, to your two favorites or to one of them, Wittgenstein, yeah. um, <coughs> there are two questions. One is, you said you, are, you, don't care much, you don't care very much about theory, you just do things. Uh, but you read Wittgenstein, you read Heidegger. Oh, sure. On the other hand, there's the, the second question would be, uh, Wittgenstein built his own house. And as, as far as I know, he, you know, he was very, very uh, crazy about all the little details going exactly as he wanted to do it. Well, how, how, how do you think about you know, the house built by Wittgenstein? The house was built, the very, you hit actually the point. He <coughs> accepted more as the, f <coughs> the external form of the house, more or less as language context. So he chose a context. He actually had an architect, his name was Engelhardt, mm -hmm. whom he commissioned was to do the professional stuff. And I think he was very fond of laws, so he more or less accepted that aesthetic expression of a language and applied it to the external uh, composition of the house. But he himself was only really interested, as he is in his philosophy, uh, in language, is in the decomposition to the vocabulary, into the syllables. Hmm? So he started to focus. You see, the clarity of the inside is totally divorced from the more or less cliche of the outside. The inside, he goes so far that he has a whole series of different kind of how columns start to appear when they uh, collided with walls. So at certain points you have quarter columns, half columns, full columns, or you know, the, the proportions of the doors and things like that. Synchronization of double windows, which also is an indigenous Austrian phenomenon, like uh, they have a little pillow between the you know, two windows uh, to protect itself against the cold, mm -hmm. which he's somehow monumentalized by synchronizing huge uh, you know, glass panels in the doors and they, they open up together. Mm -hmm. Things like that. So it's actually very consistent in that respect, in, in terms of his philosophy, of that there's no no meaning per se. That the meaning actually comes out of any manifestation of the language you use. That this, a sentence is true by itself, not what it expresses. So what time is it? Then? As we're cooking, you know, as I'm I'll keep going a little bit, no? <laughs> so when, when, when you're quoting <coughs> Heidegger, or Wittgenstein, whatever it is, uh, you, <coughs> you've got a smile. Or well, you've got to smile more often. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, Heidegger, I have to smile because see, Heidegger, I, I despised Heidegger for a long time. I mean, that's what Viennese tradition, more or less. He was more or less regarded as a you know, second. And you had something that And I discovered him actually very recently. Blut and Boden. What? You were saying last night. No, this has to do with my book. Well, I did a Heidegger book which was Blut and Boden. No, I would say so. Maybe the German is not in New York. I don't think so. What I meant with Blue Bone is a is a ideology of folklore. There's a very interesting story with the book. I mean probably a few of you know the book. There's a book which deals with the vernacular in the European Alps, which I recorded. It's called Elementary Active too, which I was just interested in because I grew up in Tyrol and when I started to study architecture, and I got very intrigued by the elemental purity of those structures. I only recorded uh, non-habitational uh, structures. So I applied for, I just finished school, so I applied for, for a little grant from the Tyrolean 
controlled the government and uh, met the senator and she explained to him that I wanted to do it. So I got the grant. And then when the book uh, came out, then he never would talk to me again. <laughs> See, because he expected the uh, you know, folklore, the folkloristic sort of uh, um, what were interpretation your early of influences? A what were your early influences? Early influences. Yeah. Early influences. Actually, when I was think back, what I did in school was pretty horrifying. <laughs> projects. <laughs> but sometimes I think when I apply really high standards when I talk to my students, and I think back what I did when I was uh, in school was pretty, pretty dreary. I started actually very late to sort of to to do independent architecture in terms of you know, sort of age ones. Don't really know what the influences were. I mean, influences were uh, maybe going kind of back. Peter was asking about this Viennese sort of the whole myth of the Viennese school. There were people who were interested in the same maybe aesthetic phenomena, which were influenced. We're not so much. Uh, other people's work. It was more or less really a discovery like of the of the uh, anti-aircraft installations in Vienna which were considered, you know, people in Nazi would be considered as hor horrible things that we sort of discovered the best fantastic architecture, things like that. Mm -hmm. So these were really the very first influences mm -hmm. sort of to get you away from the traditional interpretation of architecture. Mm -hmm. And during that time, it, I must say, then, it was very active. I mean, one met in the coffee house and discussed things, and, and so things there may influences which may be discovered later on. But like the house uh, Peter and I did with the rock and the two and the four spheres, we just went on a trip to drink wine somewhere <coughs> in uh, in Burgenland. And all of a sudden, we saw this incredible rock mysteriously lying on this on this hill, and this inspired us to do a house together. So it's, it's very very more or less uh, personal experiences, really out of, directly out of the means context generated most of the earlier films. So, you're running out of ammunition? <laughs> <laughs> But there's an interesting thing now taking place. Is that, at least in America, it's taking place, or in New York, is that it became fashionable also to do, for, let's say, building architects, also to do conceptual architecture. So everybody's now also doing, uh, started showing galleries and drawings and stuff. It's very interesting. Right? Yeah. Why do you think that is? No, they feel, you see, they feel there's a, a general interest now in, in that. So, so like the, what we call the art scene is a little bit low. I mean, there's nothing happening of any uh, uh, interest. No? So they start to discover that there were some people who kept working they quietly. They discover art. Yeah, they discover art, there's architecture. Yeah. That was interesting. They never cared before, but now yeah. they... So now, as a, this interest, of course, causes immediate interest of, of, of the others because they are always out for business, no? in a sense. <laughs> so uh, this is that's what causes the interest. This, this was the interesting thing in, this, in the Biennale uh, exhibition because people selected were really selected for uh, more or less political reasons. And I mean, they are all competent people in their own whatever they do. Yeah. But they didn't do it there. See, there they tried to play a little bit art. You know, so they all made, that's what made it. I mean, I don't know, but you didn't see it. You didn't go there. So when I saw what people like Cesar Pelli, they were really competent professionals, but they, they tried to play artists. It was the, you know, the sad thing about it. I don't know how long it's going to last, but at least the attempt is there. And I tried to really well, see consciously. Pelly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or you, get, <laughs> yeah. you get offers now from galleries to show in galleries, which I try to avoid. Yeah. Do you get any sense, bar barometrics, or a sense of, of uh, this, this city over the last three visits? This, uh, London? Yeah. 
you know, thinking about a year ago, three years ago, whatever it was. The city, I think, has not changed that much, but maybe the, the, you got more relaxed. <laughs> the A is very calm. I saw some very nice projects. So, I mean, some, I think, uh, but one never knows, you see, if one changes or the, or the environment changes. So I'm always very cautious about, about coming to a conclusion about that. And I haven't really seen, I only saw very few things in, in at the AA, what's, you know, what's happening. But I mean, you've been saying since you've been here that you feel now spiritually that or you just enjoy Italy more than Austria. Oh yeah, no doubt about that. And, but, but Austria is, uh, there's another thing happening now which has, I think, to do with the total political structure and which is sort of this social, social democracy where everything is equal in there. And a certain... Is that the fact that it's not? Or the effect everybody. I mean, I think every party, with very few examples, very, very few people have not been bought getting a, I don't know, professorship. Yeah. I mean, professorship there means really, I mean, life, lifetime, yeah. <laughs> lifetime tenure, you know? So it's all this kind of attitude that everybody just tries to secure his uh, positions and there's no interest in discussion. No more bounds. No, no more bounds. No, no <laughs> more bounds. <coughs> That's sad. Which is, of course, very sad, I mean, much sadder for one who knows it well and grew out of it and remembers how, you know, how it was. But I must say, in Italy, it's, Italy is still very alive. There's still a lot of people, especially in Milan, who are very serious about architecture and, and keep working on it. Yes. So I'm, I feel actually much more home to go there, go to London, than go to, go to Austria. Because one more biographical, I think we're going to stop now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs>